Hi, everyone. Welcome to Geeks of the Roundtable. I am your co-host, Kelly Sosan Bear, along with Emily Horn from Buddhist Geeks. And today mm -hmm. we are joined by two deep, amazing women practitioners, Trudy Goodman and Sophia Diaz. And before we begin, I'd just like to introduce you to them more fully. Trudy Goodman is the executive director and founding teacher of Inside LA, a nonprofit organization for Vipassana meditation training and secular mindfulness education. And Trudy was a psychotherapist in private practice for 25 years and studied Buddhist meditation for 36 years with Asian and Western teachers. And she's the fourth teacher of the MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, which was taught which she taught with its creator, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. She's also the guiding teacher and co-founder of the original Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the first center in the world dedicated to integrating these two disciplines. So welcome, Jude, Trudy. And Sophia Diaz. Sophia is a Hatha Yoga master and a lineage holder in the Balasara Swati lineage of the South Indian Temple Arts and a recipient of numerous meditation empowerments in both Tibetan and the Shakta Tantric traditions. And she turns the body wisdom practices that she's empowered in into accessible teachings and practices for the modern Western mind. Being an inspired woman practitioner, the rigors of her practice have resulted in great clarity and expertise in the domain of feminine spiritual practice, which she has been generously teaching for over 30 years. So welcome, Sophia. And today's topic is um, feminine practice and gender roles in Buddhism. So I thought a great way to kick this off is to start with just the basics. What is feminine practice? Because um, we're making a distinction here. There's, you know, there's practice, and then we make the distinction of feminine practice. Um, so what is what is how do how do you guys define feminine practice? Uh, what is it for you? How do you personally engage this, both in your own practice and with your students? Um, just kind of want to throw that out there for someone to pick up. Hmm. I'd love, I'd love to pick that one up because it is, um, you know, I think it's the semantics, but it's also the result of a lot of confusion and a non-examination of something really huge, and that is the difference, the exact difference between uh, feminine and masculine and ge the gender of male and female, and so feminine. Uh, spiritual practice because I have just had quite a ride from being trained and actually you know a lot of reflection in the South Indian temple arts because it is a lot of conductivity in your body it's a very uh, intense meditative but physical discipline and so my teachers through parables and all kinds of things reflected me what a tomboy that I was and this lit up this entire dimension that I became really sensitive to when I would come back to the United States and kind of see what people had going on in their bodies. And so it has been like I've had, you know, probably like magnifying glasses on both eyes looking at this dimension. And so I'm just going to throw out what my experience has resulted in the definition. Um, I would call the feminine aspect of any spiritual practice, man or woman, the devotional aspect, the feeling dimension versus the insight and contemplative dimension. Now there is a, you know, there's a physicality to contemplation and everything, but I'm saying if we separate them and develop them as very distinct things, there is, um, you know, just the entire, you know, embodiment of like the Japanese flower arranging principle that is also a demonstration of great devotion to life force itself and then there is the insight that that arises from so another part of feminine practice is that it actually requires a lot of body conductivity of awareness you know it's an action with the body rather than a disappearance into a particular insight practice Mm -hmm. So that's yes. what I'm going to throw out. <laughs> so, so feminine does not mean woman or female, but feminine in terms of an energetic. Yes. In terms of two dynamisms that are present, and I would say it's possible to emphasize both, but we 
have inherited a culture and a cultural interpretation of all of the traditions that tends to be more masculine oriented which mm -hmm. you know the symbolic word the philosophy the contemplation the insight and so I'm saying a very biased perspective in order to bring out the conversation <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, when I look at the beginnings, when I started to practice in the, um, I guess, early 70s, actually, and what it was like starting out in Buddhist practice, in Zen and Vipassana were the two, um, the two areas of Buddhism where I really trained and studied, there were practically no female teachers. I mean, we could talk about feminine and masculine energies, but um, as Sophia was saying, in our culture, they do tend to constellate in male and female bodies, um, and that we're conditioned to hold one or the other. And when I started out, there really, there really were so few women teachers. There were so few female voices in the recorded teachings, and. I began to wonder where where were the women all these centuries, millennia actually. Mm -hmm. We know they were there. We know they were practicing. We know they were strong and accomplished. And you know, one of the great things about that drew me to Buddhism in the first place to Buddhist practice was that the Buddha believed so clearly that women had the exact same sense bases, their bodies were made of the same elements have the same aggregates um, of experience and therefore the same absolute qualifications to find the highest spiritual truths and and so that that was just a deep question for me where where are the women and what happened to them and it intersected with being part of the women's movement in the very early again 1971 early days of the consciousness raising movement and understanding that what we had inherited was a literature psychology to a large extent so many fields um, that was designed by and for men and not to throw out the hierarchies and lineages and say you know men with titles or men in robes are the problem they're not it was a much wider problem of um, we would call it patriarchy, which stands for the whole way that women's lives and voices couldn't be honored. And that's changed so much now. But when we started, that's the way it was. And mm -hmm. our teachers taught us equally, and we trained equally hard, all of us together. There was no distinction between you know, women and men in our training. Um, but then the examples that would be used, the metaphors that would be used, the books that, and teachings that we read, um, they were very, very male at that time. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, um, how did that, as a, as a practitioner, did that affect you at all? Would, did you feel like you were missing some kind of uh, like female role model practitioners? Yes, it, it was a longing. I felt a longing. I used to ask my first teacher about it. and. You know, he didn't really understand, but then he began, he actually was, um, he had a kind of prophetic voice and, and would say, you know, um, in the next century, it's going to be women who carry this practice. But mm -hmm. I didn't really see how we were going to get at that time from where we were <laughs> to there. And now, you know, here we are to a large extent. But yes, I felt a longing for uh, female voices and teachers. And so what we did is we started groups and we held conferences on women in Buddhism. And <laughs> I actually found, um, I found a female teacher and I was overjoyed. Maureen Stewart Roshi was a very powerful Zen teacher and she had had three kids. She was a concert pianist. She wore lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> and I fell in love with her. And yes, there was a tremendous longing for that. Um, and it, it wasn't so much a need for permission. Um, I was always feisty and strong. I think it was just the longing for company, for somebody who's down the road a little and who um, 
in their Dharma talks would talk about her children being born from her body like ripe fruit and you know would just tell the stories of women's embodiment because that was the other thing there was such an emphasis on transcendence mm -hmm. and transcending the body mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. that ev and, and so much to do with us as females you know I used to say where's the milk where's the blood where's the dirt this is you know uh, who's going to clean that guga that collects in the drain of the sink, you know, before we all have yeah, yeah. disposals? <laughs> I mean, it's the women who do that. And mm -hmm. so there was just a longing for that female embodiment. And I guess, Sophia, you found it in the physicality of your yoga practice. Um, I don't know. I'm interested well, in that Well, part. that was that was after um, I had the same experience because I was, you know, I hope this is okay language, but it just really is the feeling that I had that I was so attracted in college to um, any, you know, transcendent tradition that I always found myself in the company of men instructors of all of these things from yes. a chi class yes to the meditation classes and I had a profound longing for the company of women but I was so enraptured with being given anything that I really feel that it was only you know probably tw like 10 or 12 years ago that I noticed that I had practiced really hard to erase myself and a big part of that self erasure including you know, the perfection of Hatha Yoga and all these ways that I didn't realize I was doing was because I was deeply ensconced in a way I wasn't aware of, of this very masculine perspective, which is always about transcendent versus qualities. Like you can actually fill in qualities with your enlightened nature as well as transcend them, you know? And I had erred in the direction of, of transcending a lot, and it was just... This one seminar, a co-teacher brought something up, and I had this huge experience of going, oh my gosh, what a waste of time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but my yearning for com the company yeah. of women, now I was very squeamish about being held in the totally feminine disposition, which was the entrance to the study of the South Indian Temple Arts. Now I knew enough of the devotional genius in it. it had nothing to do with submission it had to do with a very profound rigor and my teachers held me in that you know just in terms of of dress and and breath and I had to relearn how to walk and all kinds of things and I shed so many bodily resistances to being who I am and had so much more energy that that's what lit me up about this whole embodiment thing and then I'd come back and notice how it wasn't happening for so many women that I totally respected relative to their practice and <laughs> their genius in the world but I did recognize this kind of suffering of a of a shored upness in terms of bodily expression yeah. so that launched you know basically everything that I do but I, I did not notice like you did, so I have to commend you just hugely that you actually sought out women that were beyond your, your level of advancement. And I was just so happy to get any information that it took me decades to notice that I had deeply absorbed this very particular priority that I do think comes along with the nervous system of the gender of being a man. I don't think it's for everybody, but I do think it's more common of a disposition in literally the neurological buildup of a man versus a woman. I just totally took it on because they were the teachers. I think I was just more rebellious than you. I don't know how commendable that is. <laughs> I just think that, you know, for me, I, I, I practiced because I loved to practice. And the whole emphasis on achievement or 
um, moving up in the lineage, becoming this kind of teacher. Or th there were steps. First, you take five precepts, then you take ten precepts, then you. Be, and, and I think I just rebelled against that because I loved to practice, and I had been brought up to be achievement oriented and to do well in school, and I had done well in school and gone to good schools. So there was a part of me that just did not want that to be my spiritual practice, that mm. same mind. And then the other difference is. Uh, well, I do thank the women's movement too, because I mm. was a feminist before I was a Buddhist. But then, the <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and I, no, but that was fortunate for me. And I think the other part that just could not be denied is I was a mom. Mm -hmm. I was a mom. Mm. So there was yeah. only so far it could go for me. Right, right. Kind of training you were free to do. You see, right, I, right. I couldn't move into the Zen Center and become a sort of boy girl you know, in mm -hmm. there, in that mm -hmm. system with my, yeah. you know, um, sort of almost cropped hair and wire rim glasses. I did get the wire rim glasses because <laughs> they were stylish. They were stylish, yes. And I was um, fashion conscious. We all wore flannel shirts and work boots. And, <laughs> and now today I think, oh my God, I squandered my most beautiful years in you know, baggy work pants and Anyway, so yeah. but, <laughs> but I think that the, the being a mom part, it was, it was experienced sometimes as a limitation, but I knew deep in my bones that had been the doorway for me into what you call devotion or I would call just love mm -hmm. of um, this other dimension of being. And, and I knew it deeply because my first sort of big spiritual opening happened while I was giving birth, I think I was 21 years old, oh I, had never, I, I had never read anything about Buddhism or done yoga or anything at that point, actually. And, mm. and then I began looking for those things because of the experience that I had and, mm. and realizing, oh, this, this world, uh, this is not what I thought it was. Right. There's, a, <laughs> there's a lot more to it here. <laughs> and I think, too, because of that, the early spiritual experiences that I had came to me um, during times of enormous suffering when I just happened to be up against it and alone. Um, mm. One was giving birth. Nobody gives birth alone anymore. It was just a weird thing that happened. Um, <laughs> I'll say. <you> know, <laughs> Mid-century. Anyway, um, and then my daughter, when she was two and a half, um, she got a catastrophic illness. She was in the children's hospital mm -hmm. in Geneva, Switzerland for two and a half months. And for the first couple of weeks, her life was really in the balance. She was in a coma for a long time. And then when she came out, she, it was really in the balance. And so wow. there was another experience when they had a code and all these doctors came running and they were working on this tiny little body with all these tubes. And that was, you know, my body because that was my first experience of yeah you know the connection and the merging and that not being one person and and that just being up against that intensity of that kind of suffering um, mm. again there was an opening and i just i saw god i knew and having those experiences taught me that they didn't belong to buddhism or christianity or judaism or any of the traditions mm -hmm. and and I think that was lucky. I think that was fortunate. Um, so I just, I just chose a tradition that um, fit the best out of the ones that existed, that I knew about. Absolutely. In the way you just described it, it I feel, and I feel traditions to be like SOS pads. You know, exactly. Away exactly. The, <laughs> the obstructions, the burn. <laughs> to our nature, yeah. you know, the fundamental nature, but when you get a hit like that and it's undeniable, then you are attracted to particular things that are karmic, you know, that Absolutely. what you're attracted to to answer it. And I do feel like we have motives that can be divided along the two lines of feminine motives and masculine motives. And I think, you know, you can correct me if your experiences are are wrong, but I feel like we de-emphasize the fact that perfect insight is perfect love, is, you know, a suspended state of a boundless rapture as well as 
emptiness clarity. And we just have a tendency to emphasize one or the other, which is why I think it's so important because I go around in teaching settings and basically, you know, I, I'm a little bit nuts about doing this is giving women permission yeah. for their experience because it is not this, um, always this emptiness thing. And as soon as I feel a woman criticizing the expansiveness as well as the stillness, it's, it's something that we just naturally do. Like, oh, it, it only fits in this, you know, category or description. And you just described the whole spectrum in your experience, you know, including the rigor of recognition that suffering brings one to. You know, your eyes have to be open completely, and there is massive insight, but the view that comes is, like you said, it's, it's, you're not separate from God. It's, it's love. It's unbounded perfection, even though there's so much suffering. Yes, and I think I really bow to Sharon Salzberg for bringing love front and center into our Buddhist tradition. And, you know, in Zen too, it's, it's implicit. It's always implicit. It's so mm -hmm. rarely explicit. Maybe today. I haven't really trained in Zen for a long time. So, Kelly, you can say something about that. But, but, and for psychotherapy too, you know, I had this whole other, um, my livelihood, um, and discipline of Western psychology and psychotherapy and and I felt like yes to talk about the kind of attention just the kind of attention we're offering to each other as a form of love nobody was doing that because that word was unprofessional un, right. uh, undisciplined mm -hmm. uh, not empty <laughs> yeah no and yeah. it's um you know, it's a huge distinction one of my greatest teachers made that blew my mind away is he, he said, feeling is a capacity distinct from emotion. And when you feel without bounds, it's like you're not separate. You are love. Everything is love, you know. Mm. But the emotion that we have relegated that word to as a culture has an embarrassment factor to it. You know, it's kind of yeah. like that's yeah. what needs to be cleaned up, that romantic superficiality. And, you know, as soon as I heard that the Chinese have five words for love, it kind of widened my view of the fact that I had to start adding things to that word to make sure that it wasn't confused for the emotion that everybody feels is the limitation, you know. Instead, it's like another word for our fundamental nature in a, in a dynamism, you know, an in-life dynamism is what, it, what my experience of it is. Although, I've got to say, you know those suspended moments of total stillness where it's like right after your heart has just broken open from something, either something terrible or wonderful, mm -hmm. and then it's like everything is still moving but nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. And I would call that searing love, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> once again. Yeah. That is so mm -hmm. clear, Sophia. I love that distinction. It is so clear because love, it's, yes, it's mushy and, and attached, attached, you know, that sticking mm -hmm. attachment that we are taught to fear so deeply. And, um, and, what you, yeah, it's really clear what you just said. I used to talk about the difference between attachment and attunement. Mm -hmm. And that attunement, attunement is really what you have just so articulately expressed. Exactly. Because, yeah. you know, the fundamental thing in even, you know, Einstein opened it up in the technicality of our world is that we are truly unbounded light. And the feeling of light is, lo you know, love, but it's not the emotion of love. It's that no. fundamental, indestructible nature. And that the emphasis of practicing based on that, I feel like, is a, f is a feminine choice rather than the seeking of freedom from qualities, which is, you know, I've got to say I've attracted my opposites in every profound relationship that I have ever had, I almost have to laugh 
at the fact that we get to the same place, but my motive is so different. You know? yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's that... Uh, the freedom thing, the kind of erasure of qualities, where to me it's like the outshining of qualities is what the delicious attraction factor. Now, of course, I've sat, you know, enough to be confused about which one is which, but <laughs> but it's a that's the distinction that I would make about a masculine preference is initially freedom from qualities, which is a kind of love. And a feminine preference is to unconfuse all qualities with that unbounded love. So it's through and participatory in things like being a kindergarten teacher or being a mother. You know, you cannot, well, there are people who do it who basically are full of stillness and are in the midst of that, but your attention has to be full of all the qualities. And that's what I would call successful feminine practice is total immersion, non-separateness from what could be considered chaos, but is fundamentally mind-spinning love, <laughs> colorful confetti of reality. <laughs> Sounds like you're talking about children. <laughs> yeah, because they're know, the ones that, yeah. you, that you can't, you know, you think you're all realized and then you spend some time with kids. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think that's probably why I spent most of my professional life working with and around children. And I think for that reason, those qualities, the confetti, the chaos, the freedom to fully embody who they are. And I don't want to totally idealize children because they kick and fight each other freely too, but um, which is something we've mostly learned not to do, um, <laughs> but or we do it in different way. <laughs> in the at least, subtle, at least in the, I was going to say, at least we don't do it in the gross realm. Other realms, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But that freedom to to fully to be in the body. I mean, what you're talking about, the freedom to embody these qualities and to understand they too are doorways into vast emptiness or stillness or wisdom and compassion. Um, just the distinction between wisdom and compassion, for example, in our tradition, compassion mm -hmm. gets feminized, and then it then it then it becomes, would you believe it, less important in less some way? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you know, any experience of emptiness or wisdom or still whatever word we put on it, it it contains compassion. Compassion is the the air of it or the mm -hmm. the atmosphere of it, and so just the focus on I think what would be the opposite of transcendence immanence that mm, embodiment yes. the immanence of things is what I've been drawn to and I love that you talked about people who have the quiet who have the stillness who have the wisdom but they aren't wearing any particular hat or credential mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we can we have sonar for that we feel that. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that, to, to respect and honor that, I think is also, it's so beautiful and very feminine. Yes, and also the capacity to notice that in somebody that isn't wearing a hat is actually a feeling capacity, you know, to be able yes. to feel the person yes. and then revere it. And I had, you know, we're, it, when we're seeking some kind of idealized tradition, which I always was, you know, I realized I was given so many moments of complete perfection and one was at the de Young Museum in San Francisco. I was in college and I had to do a research paper and I went into their Japanese garden and there was this elderly man that is the reason why I sidled over to the bench, you know, and he was an Asian man and he did this exercise that I still teach, but it was everything about the comportment of his being. And Mexican culture is full of a really great relationship to elderly people, so I didn't, I didn't have any qualms striking up a conversation respectfully about, you know, how old are you? You're so magnificent. And he did not know. And he said um. that he was a very different person up until the age of 60. Now, he didn't say what happened to him, but he said that he had been doing the exercise I just saw him do every day since he was 60. And you could tell that his contemplation, his love, you know, the, the look in his eyes I've only seen from my own grandmother, 
and the generosity with passing on the wisdom of the simple swinging thing that he said revolutionized his awareness. He didn't say it like that. He said that it allowed me to change my life in a way it needed to be changed. And the, he, he didn't speak much, and then he just sat there. And here I am seeking traditions and, you know, to have a star put on my head of appropriate practice. And <laughs> I was given, like, everything on a, on a park bench in San Francisco when I was avoiding writing a paper, you know? <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> but I'm glad that I felt him. But once again, I relegated that experience into a different pocket than practice, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or, tra or transmission. Until yeah. now. <laughs> and, and going yeah. back just to that, the experience of a male teacher, I'm just curious what you guys think as female teachers, as women teachers. Um, how do you hold the role of teacher differently? then you see your um, peers, um, men teachers, holding the role of teacher. That's clear. I have a question. Yeah. Well, first you, of all, I want to say I, I have immense gratitude for my men teachers. I mm -hmm. never felt in any way that I was treated as less than or encouraged mm -hmm. to be less in any way. And that that is huge. And I, mm -hmm. I just bow to them and love them. Mm -hmm. and so there's that. And then I also feel that the way that I am and the way that I teach might be very different from other women as well because mm -hmm. many women who came up with the male teachers are also maybe doing things still more in that way. Um, like totally. Sophia was yeah. talking about when she shifted from that perspective. But I definitely know that the way that I teach I think I come in closer to people. I feel that it's more intimate. Um, I feel that I teach much more through, maybe this is what you were calling the feeling um, faculty, Sophia, but I teach much more from a felt sense um, of no separation where I actually feel I can become, mm. in a sense, the person that I'm with. And, mm. and that capacity um, to shift in a way the location, the subject objects mm -hmm. yes, yes. of our consciousness. Sometimes you might call it empathy, but it feels more than that. It feels like a willingness to become something or someone and, and then learn what it's like, what the world mm -hmm. looks like through those, through those eyes, like entering mm -hmm. the world of a child, for example. Um, and, I, and when I'm with a group, it's different, and especially with a very, very big group, it's different. But there is, again, that felt sense of, mm. of the room. And I think because I love nature, I'm, this is also perhaps very feminine, too, to just feel so connected to nature. And mm -hmm. uh, that we, we, there's a way of um, going direct without the intermediary of too many methods or techniques. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But just going direct to that connection, um, and I don't talk. I'm not talking about merging in any pathological sense. I just no, don't. no, <laughs> um, no. You, I think you described it really incredibly because you talked about the feeling faculty and that being in the forefront of changing the center of your awareness to be inclusive enough to. I do have a word to refer to it. I refer to it as communion. Which yeah, is a very, yeah. res, it's a very responsible and it, ta it takes bodily conductivity, awareness, feeling, and there's a non-randomness to your feeling participation in your own body in order to do that. Absolutely. And so it's not that, uh, you know, whatever the psychological term that you used, I just, it's so obviously so distinct from that because it's a very responsible participation I do think it takes a lot of the. Pra I think that it rests upon a lot of practice because we carry a lot of fear about who we are, and that to me is what a sitting practice or any discipline kind of sheds. What I call the carcass of habits that we inherited from our lineage, <laughs> and and makes communion much easier. You know, all the other disciplines make it 
much easier, but I I just wanted to totally agree on the huge distinction of the, you know, neurotic glomming into somebody and the dignified yeah. use yeah. of the feeling faculty to change um, really your, our self-centeredness. That's what it is. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And it's, it's also linked to what you said about not being afraid because out of the years of sitting and practicing um, in the various modalities we practice, there comes a knowing of oneself and a willingness to go there wherever there is and to go there with somebody else to the extent that we're not afraid of our own minds and our mm -hmm. own hearts anymore. And that mm -hmm. is such a great liberation mm -hmm. that this practice offers to us. But you're right, it takes practice because we have to know, we have to have the discernment to understand, oh, this feeling is not me. I am feeling this feeling which actually belongs to the person I'm with. And right. to be able to see and discern. And you could probably put it into words um, better, but that is definitely a fruit of the practice. Yeah. Mm. To be able to do that. Mm. To be able to know in addition to using oneself fully, opening fully in the service of another, of knowing and understanding another, to also be able to know that which is still me, that which is not me. And right. to be able to hold the yeah. oneness, the oneness and the two-ness simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult. Yes. And it's also, I would say that it is our um, example of sainthood because for that very learning, I still look to Mother Teresa because there is, a, there is a yogic magic in doing that the way that she did it because she did not contract any of the diseases of the people that other people would not touch. And she would caress them and hug them. And I would say it's the greatest example of that. Um, it is a yogic skill, actually. Yes, it's it being seated yeah. in a view because she said, I just see Jesus. You know, I mean, that's yeah. what she would say. Yeah. And so she's established in a non separate place from the absolute nature of things. There's a rigor, you know, to it, and you could see it and feel it. And, and she did not contract in anything that everybody else was afraid of in touching these people who were in such horrific states. And that. You know, it's like the example. There is an actual, um, there is an actual powerful uh, practice that transcends the laws of what we presume from that very act. But you have, obviously, you have to be centered in a very profound recognition instead of self-centered. Yeah. Again, once again. Yeah. It's and, interesting that you bring up that you that you bring up Mother Teresa in this regard because. Yeah, she had that, that almost like you're saying, that yogic magic protection yeah. um, that she carried. At the same time, when you read that, that her letters, mm -hmm. um, what's so clear, I felt so sad for her in a way because I felt here is this woman with the power that she had to do this, to give this love everywhere mm -hmm. all the time and to live... Um, to live the way she lived and what she embodied and to keep going even when she personally was experiencing a lot of depression and disconnection she wouldn't have called it that and mm -hmm. and yet she turned to the male spiritual directors for help when she herself was the source like just this yeah. powerhouse mm -hmm. of connection to the divine to Jesus to however you conceive of it and I feel like in her, she didn't get the help she needed mm -hmm. from those male spiritual directors who were so, um, in a way, bound to the tradition and the hierarchy they were part of. And yes. just interesting. It, it is. And, she but she, she, I think she also referred to the ruthlessness of her lover, Jesus. You know, is it? <laughs> She was not given an out by not having the company that was any more advanced to help her out. And she mm -hmm. also felt that to be a part of the given communication of a love of Jesus, you know. But as a, but I get, again, I feel like 
any incredible advancement is absolutely a harder load to carry as a woman because there isn't the capacity to recognize what it takes to support a woman because we are coming into a time where that is just becoming acceptable you know like yes. the other letters that are so amazing to read is how much self denigration was in every single one of Teresa of Avila's letters because she would have gotten beheaded or burned at the stake. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And her strategy yes. was so intelligent that she saved, she created a practice space for some incredible practitioners that were all women. And mm -hmm. but she she pushed the button of self effacement so that it is horrifying, you know, but she changed the face. Yeah. of contemplative Catholicism and Christianity because her realization and the realizations of her nuns were so significant that she snuck it into the conversation as well you know so the unacceptability and this is something that I have discovered in a subtle way in the last few years because I'm such an idealist you know you get so busy just doing what you do is that there is a questionableness to a deeply realized woman yeah. there just is yeah. as, as an authority you know so how many women would challenge what I was teaching them about their periods you know and here I am like you know I have done more yoga during my period and they were adhering to the instructions of men and wouldn't even enter into the conversation they would just call me wrong and I was like hold on hold on a second I am a woman <laughs> you know I do bleed monthly and I I do turn upside down and make use of all these skill sets. I am living it so you can trust the information, you know. It, but the the fact that I had to justify myself, you know, the suspectness. There came a point where I went, I am I'm so tired of my love being suspect. And then I realized that it is a cultural growing curve mm -hmm. and this is where my greatest compassion is actually needed. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a charge about that, to be grateful about the growing curve that you just talked about in your lifetime, Trudy. Yes. It's just so beautiful. Yeah, it's in but our lifetime. There, there come these places where, oh my gosh, you know, as, as a woman, you're just bereft. Whereas there's all these, you know, even, uh, you know, even in corporate worlds, there's all of these supports for the pillar, you know. Yeah. But it doesn't look yeah. the same when you're when when you're a woman, and I think it's also like my greatest. I think my greatest lesson of being a teacher, because I teach a body art, and I never wanted to teach men. I mean, I know it sounds biased, but because I was actually terrified of their attraction, and I was so grateful that I had a partner and some very ruthless teachers that said nobody can actually give these men what you have or we would put a man in front of them you know so and they made me face my fear and the worst happened in the first most dedicated men's yoga class great men the worst possible thing happened horror of horrors I'm surprised I could breathe through it is two of these men fell mercilessly I would say attracted to me you know and it was so good because I think the clearest thing that I have to offer because it's a body practice but anytime that I teach anything the acknowledgement that I that a woman's form is the most um, depicted form which means it's one of the most attractive forms in this particular universe and to own that dynamic clearly and to be very clear and clean about my own energy I think is one of the greatest uh, mm -hmm. lessons that I that I got along the way because I actually dealt with that with complete clarity and total honesty and we're all still grateful for that moment friends now you know this was a long time ago friends now but I learned to not suppress something about myself and also to acknowledge the dynamic that some men actually feel weakened by my direction but they get over it because it's good information 
<laughs> but when I feel that dynamic, I never take it personally. I know that once again, it's because I'm being very directive and I'm the embodiment of a woman and I'm not a very masculine woman. You know, I'm definitely very forceful, but I'm not a mass, you know, deep voiced and everything else. So that is the biggest thing about the gender of being a woman teacher and teaching men is the acknowledgement of the magnetism between men and women and I feel like that is one of the most unaddressed things in culturally that we tend to do. We tend to blur genders, call out sameness, and then you have a scandal, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, at least, in, at least in this country. We do it more in this country, I think, that yeah. blurring of gender differences. and Definitely. And, and you know, it started, it, I think it started in some kind of healthy or compassionate way of trying to address the polarization and um, some of the discrimination against women. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll just, you know, we'll just get strong and be like them. And it, it, so it wasn't, it didn't come from something bad, but then we, I think many, um, many women, I don't know, almost like forgot or were ashamed of the feminine. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I really love being a feminine woman. And I really love feeling that the way that m many men are just drawn to that. Mm -hmm. exactly. And it's, and I'm drawn to that in them. I mean, they're, Yes. Man madness too. And so I think one of the least talked about it's yes, it's gender and blurring, but it's also sexuality. Yes. And that sexuality, what's happened to sexuality and the objectification, all the things we know of women's bodies and beauty and um and I live in Los Angeles where I really see it so, yeah. so much, so much. Um that's the conversation that's often missing in mm -hmm. the circles that we travel in because it came from a monastic tradition. Yes. And, and just as I see women who are home with their little kids longing for some woman who will talk about spiritual practice in a way that's possible for them to mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. uh, I feel there's a kind of longing from both men and women to have a conversation about sexuality and um, I was teaching a mindfulness and sexuality um, uh, class at one point, and a very senior teacher in our tradition, I was trying to just ask different people, what is your experience of mm -hmm. sexuality in the practice? And I said something about mindfulness and sexuality, and this teacher said, mindful sexuality is not possible. <laughs> so... You know, the idea, so I think there again, anything that we push aside, we push outside of our mm, practice, we totally. say this is not part of our practice, it's going to take over and become so powerful mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. by definition then it's outside of awareness, right? We're not exactly. working like that. Yeah, it's that, a shadow. Mm -hmm. That is the exact definition of demonic is actually that. It's not like, you know, the objectified ghoulies. That is the definition is when you... Right. separate from your awareness a powerful impulse it gets just as powerful more powerful but is it is no it no longer has any consciousness to it it doesn't go right. away right. and then it seeps out and sabotages you in all these different ways that you're not even aware of yep. which and is I, why it's I, just important to work with with every element that comes up not just the ones you like or the ones <laughs> that are acceptable culturally or otherwise, even well, in your sangha. But culturally it's important too because I'm a grandmother now. I'm an... Um, mm. an Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And I love the word abuela because it mm. is a revered condition in, um, say, in Mexican culture, whereas in my culture to say grandmother, if you say, oh, you don't look like a grandmother, it's like that's, con like, ah. that's considered to be a compliment that I don't look like a grandmother. Well, this is a grandmother, and now I look like one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But what I was starting to say is that my granddaughter, who is um, 11, was she came home from school and she said, you know, Nini, which she calls me, um, something happened at school today. And I said, oh, what happened? And she said, well, Mr. Kelly, we're starting to learn about puberty. And when he said it, I couldn't stop laughing. 
and I got in trouble. And I thought, you see, this is because they don't even talk about it until fifth grade yeah. when their little bodies are already changing. And a friend of mine who is, um, is German said, this is part of the conversation from kindergarten in her country. It's just a normal part of life. And nobody, yeah. nobody giggles and gets in trouble when it's a subject at school. And this is maybe, uh, anyway, I feel this is something that women, that we, it's part of the feminine to bring this yes. into our children's lives too, without fear and shame. Exactly. Because in it's, appropriate um, ways. It's actually, you know, living in the true sovereignty of what it is to be in a body, it just takes a little linkage point, you know, just yeah. a little bit. And, um, I, for many years, I got the opportunity to teach in, a, in the beautiful community that Maharish, Maharish Mahesh Yogi founded in the Midwest. And they have an entire school system based on, I mean, total wisdom, you know, body types of learning and, and everything. But they do have children, uh, boys and girls learn separately up until a, or in a particular age and then for particular events. So it's not like it's a negative. Mixed company isn't a negative, but it's just to be able to actually address all of the, you know, body things that start coming up completely freely because yeah. I mm -hmm. just, I, especially being from a, you know, Latin culture where polarity is just really, they're sen sensitive to, if a man started telling me about puberty, I would have died. You know, <laughs> yeah. If I was a man. It's like I need, was... I need a woman to tell me about Tampax. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. or whatever that that is. That there's, there's something that I think we fear of going backward into the harsh stereotypes, but that we have to acknowledge bodily types you know just the difference mm -hmm. like we just yeah. have a different shape it takes different maintenance to be born in a woman's body doesn't matter if you identify as as a, a man or a woman in whatever body that's right different embodiments take different maintenance and it's mm -hmm. easier in same bodied company certain things you know and that I do think is a feminine mm -hmm. skill set to notice to take into account and it's beautiful. One thing I've been working on lately in terms of feminine practice and just kind of coming more into my own feminine and consciously wanting to come more into my own feminine over the last year is actually a teaching from Trudy that I heard via Emily <laughs> that I've been working with for like, I don't even know, months now, which... Teach me, teach me. It, what which, was it? Which is, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is beautiful and it leads me just to our wrap up here because we're, we're coming close to the end of time, but um, be the lover. So I've kind of used taking this like koan or guiding inquiry as be the lover. I'm going to like even cry right now because mm. I feel tender. Mm. Um, but that's yeah. made a huge difference in, in, in terms of me just sinking into my heart, sinking into my body, sinking into my feeling non-emotional state mm -hmm. and just being the lover. And, and so I just want to, one, thank you Trudy for that teaching via Emily. It's, it's been incredible these last six months for me. Um, very powerful. And with that, just um, and because uh, we do need to wrap up, um, mm -hmm. in terms of all this and this conversation and this great dialogue, just from each of you, Trudy and Sophia, what would be your, your pertinent message to the younger generation of practitioners, um, myself, Emily, Vince, um, both male and female, mm -hmm. um, just around this whole conversation? Is there kind of like a one-liner that you could each give us? Um, a word of advice, um, a message, something that you'd want us to grow into, a critique, anything that <laughs> the younger generation could benefit from as our, kind of our way to close. I would just say trust your feelings. <laughs> trust, trust, trust. And maybe I would like to use that elegant um, distinction that Sophia made between emotion and feeling. Not your reactive emotions, but that deep um, intuition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. That has never happened, except I was going to say, trust the differences that you notice between you and other people is actually trust them and, uh, you know, lovingly explore them like in the same practice of, of feeling, not emoting or charging or making that negative difference, but to actually 
uh, trust because we feel all these things bodily, but we tend to bury it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's yes. time to bring a lot of what we have a tremendous charge about that doesn't have language but bodily response. I think it's time to bring it online in the in our practice communities. Yeah. Trust and talk about it. Write talk about, about it. it. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for kicking off Geeks the Roundtable with the Strong Feminine. I, I think it's going to be um, very auspicious for the rest of the show. <laughs> yes, wonderful. thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for doing it. So wonderful to see you, meet you, and talk. I, I have fallen in love with you, Trudy. You too, <laughs> Sophia. This was um, not enough. And I just drove down to Los Angeles for a memorial, and I'm like, oh. <gasps> We're, this is just like a little bit later. I would have gone to see you. <laughs> oh, I would love to see you. Emily's talked about you, and she's right. You're wonderful. Aww, <laughs> how lovely. Well, with that, I just will end with be the lover. <laughs> yeah. Be the lover. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you, you beautiful Thank you. Buddhist geeks. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Namaste. Till next time. Till next Til time. Next